the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 673, for Sunday, September 3rd, 2017. Yeah, greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show. Where you send in questions, tips, and cool stuff found, we share it all with the goal of each of us learning at least four new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include the PDF Pen family from Smile at smilesoftware.com slash geek. Care.com, where when you visit care.com slash MGG, you get a 30% discount off of their premier membership. We will explain what that is shortly here. And Harry's, where at harrys.com slash MGG, you can get a free trial set just for paying three bucks in shipping. We'll tell you more about that shortly here, too. And here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, John F. Braun. How are you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? And I should point out, just in case something dramatic happens between Friday and Sunday when this is released, we are actually recording on Friday because of some scheduling and such going on for Labor Day weekend. But uh, so how are you today while we record this, John? Good. Good. Um, but I'd say we're a low drama show, so shouldn't be a problem. Well, right. But I'm just saying, you know, who knows? Apple could, well, something uh, dramatic could. Uh, announce some acquisition tomorrow. I doubt they will. But, you know, hey, yeah, yeah. tis the season. Yeah, I'm just staying cool. It's getting cool. That's the weather's awesome. I love this weather. I mean, it's a little early for it, but that's okay. I'll take it. I, I like it. It's good. Nice and crisp. I like and the cool. version where you don't need heat or air conditioning. That mm-hmm. and that's where we're we're at right now. That that totally. Yes. Good balance that that is rare, but yeah. Well, rare here. There are places that have that year round. <laughs> We just yeah. don't we just don't live in them. But maybe Jeff does. I don't know, but Jeff has a question. Jeff says, due to the small 256 gig SSD in my mid-2014 MacBook Pro, I have my photos library and iTunes on a USB 3 drive that is now five years old. I want to move the content contents of this drive to a new drive that I have purchased. Is a simple copy paste the best way to do this? Should I use carbon copy cloner to make a clone of the drive instead? Any thoughts are helpful. Um, you know, I, I do this too. I, in fact, on nearly every machine that I have, I have iTunes and photos and several other things just off on an external drive for exactly the same reasons, so that I can get away with, you know, either a 256 or a 512 gig SSD without just instantly filling it up. And I recently, because the hard drive in this computer here uh, in, in the studio, I've got a 2011 iMac, with pre, it's pre fusion drive, but it has the same hardware. So it's got a 256 SSD and a one terabyte uh, drive. And this drive started acting funky and, and now has completely died. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the show, as I mentioned, but um, I just, uh, I, you know, so I went, I moved to an external drive and I actually did it with carbon copy cloner because I have it right here. Um, I had backed it up previously with carbon copy cloner or maybe not even, but, um, but I, I had some level of a clone over there. So I just, I did that just to make the, uh, the number of reads on the internal drive, perhaps less uh, in case there was, you know, all that data was already over there. So, uh, but if I was starting from scratch, there's a couple ways you can do it. I mean, you can do, like you said, a copy paste. You can just drag in the finder. I mean, these are, these are just folders. I would make sure that your external drive is formatted HFS plus before you do this. A lot of drives, when you buy them, they come formatted um, fat or fat 32 or, you know, some cross platform ish format and things like, uh, f- the photos library doesn't really like to be on anything other than HFS plus or presumably APFS now, but, um, but yeah, I would format that HFS plus, and then you could copy it over or you can use in disk utility. Uh, there is, you can, you can clone a drive in there too. Uh, and I can't pull it up right now because disk utility will take forever to launch on this machine because of that dead hard drive. But, uh, but you know, that's how it goes. Thoughts on that, John. Oh Yeah. Um, 
there's an article that talks about how to do this sort of thing. And it has a number of options, not all of that were mentioned, but it mentions them all. And it's called OS X Manually Migrating Data from Another Mac. Okay. So, but this is two tips in one. We're already getting to I mean, that. this isn't coming from another Mac. This is just copying from one drive to one external drive to another, but perhaps it, it still applies. Yeah, I, I would say the things in here apply, whether you're setting up a new machine or you're moving a library. And they pretty much say as much. But they say first, uh, migration. Eh, in this Now, if you're just migrating content, then migration assistant is not appropriate. But yeah. the rest of this article is very appropriate. And then it's like, well, here's the ways you could do it. Um, for certain apps, uh, like you said, just drag stuff over, right? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, if it's all in the Apple ecosystem. So it understands what iTunes means or Photos means or, or uh, any of the major apps. It understands you know, as long as you put it in the right place. Um, but this guy doing how to do that. And it could be an external drive. You could do target disk mode. You could do it over file sharing. Whatever. Right, but he's already got this on an external drive, right? So he's just, mm -hmm. he's just saying, I want to use a different external drive now. So he's already it, like, th this is a good thing to link to, right? Because it's, it's how he got here in the first place. Um, but now that he's there, it's, we're just taking the data that's, you know, on this drive over there and moving it to that drive over there. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But just give him some background here. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So when it happens to you, but, um, the other thing occurs to me is that I don't know. I mean, five years is old. Um, I don't know. All I can say is I've had drives. I guess it depends on the make and model and and all that. I've, I've had some drives last 10 years and they still work, Dave, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, I, totally. Some drives do and some drives don't. Right. Uh, in, I, I did launch disk utility. If you highlight the drive that you want to copy to and then hit the restore button, this is how it's done in Sierra. It's kind of changed over the years, but if you hit the restore button at the top, you just pick what you want to restore from and it could be a disk image or a, a currently mounted hard drive and you just choose it and it'll, it'll blast the data over there. And, uh, and that would work too. So, and any of the above, it, you know, I, I'm almost thinking though, if you don't have a backup or a clone of that external drive, maybe using the new one or, or swapping it and using the old one as, as your clone so that you have a local clone of all that data. I think that's important. In fact, I know that's important. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Craziness. It's always crazy. You know, um, that that computer that I have here with the dead hard drive, John, the other day, I couldn't. Actually, it was Lisa. She tried to log in. She couldn't log in. And uh, I thought, oh, crap. You know, and we're not using this drive anymore. I mean, it won't even like it won't mount. I can't format it. It's dead. So we, we turned off the computer and, uh, and then turned it back on and on boot up, we heard the drive click. Right. Uh, and again, we're not using it, but as I said in a previous episode, I don't want to have to take the machine apart. Well, I think I'm going to have to take the machine apart to remove this drive because what started happening after it booted up with those clicks, for some reason, the drive is sending erroneous data to whatever it is that decides how fast the hard drive cooling fan should run. And it had that fan running at like 5,500 RPM. It sounded like a jet engine in here. And okay. I checked all the temperature sensors and they're all normal. Um, so I had to, I had to do something hmm. right. Cause I can't record with a fan running at 5,500 RPM right in front of me. So, no, and you don't want to disconnect it because it's there for a... Well, I mean, if I open it up, I'm going to disconnect it by removing the hard drive. Like right. that, 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 yes, I do want to disconnect it. I just don't want to go through that process and certainly didn't want to today. Um, so what I did was I remembered when we talked about upgrading uh, a machine from, like when you upgrade an iMac from a hard drive, to an SSD sometimes, and this could be because you don't reconnect the sensor, right? Or it could be because the, the SSD doesn't send the same type of signals as the previous hard drive. But sometimes you will get into a scenario where the fans will do this and just run full tilt on the drive. They just slowly creep up until they're at full tilt and then they stay there. Uh, and I remember there's a utility to fix that. 
And so I went and downloaded SSD fan control uh, from, what is it? Oh, who is it? From Xerion, E-X-I-R-I-O-N. Of course, we'll put a link in the show notes. And with this, it sees, you know, it sees my optical drive and it sees the hard drive. And I set it, instead of being auto, which is just letting the system do it, I set it to smart and instantly the fan slowed down. And I've been watching all our temp, all my temperature sensors here to make sure that, that it wasn't actually cooling something that it needed to cool and everything's fine. So, uh, that's so cool. yeah, well, so. one other app that's good for seeing that and dealing with that, of course, is iStat menus and that in their sensors menu, you see not only the RPM of the uh, fan, which is in itself fascinating. So I was like, how close is going to get to 2000? Well, so here's the thing that's great for looking at it. And it, it is indeed what I am using to monitor yeah, the temperature. But it lets you set the fans as well. No, it doesn't. It lets you set the minimum fan speed, but it oh, will not right. let you control the, the, so the has fan a speed. Fan control section. It okay. Does. And I see a couple of things here. Yeah, All right. But it's always okay. minimum. So I couldn't, I couldn't use iStat menus to fix this problem. I needed. Um, it's, uh, there's two of them. There's SSD fan control, which is the one I'm using. And then I think there's HDD fan control from Surtees software, which does similar things, uh, and is not free. So I figured since I was, huh? you know, doing this for a short period of time, I'd just Good go with the free one. Yeah. So I step menus lets you manage it, but not fully control. Correct. It. Correct. I just learned something. Yeah. It's That's why we do this, right? It, it makes it look like it'll let you have full control, but it doesn't. Maybe they'll right. fix that. Uh, yeah, it would be nice. Yeah, of course it's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that was my fun, you know, about an hour before showtime of saying, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, how am I going to deal with this? Cause I want, Lisa said, it sounds loud. And I thought maybe the gr drive was grinding or whatever. And I popped up here, um, and it was to pre actually to pre-record the ad spots and go through all that stuff. And I was like, oh, this is bad. <laughs> oh, well. Noise is usually bad. Noise, well. From a know. mechanical device. Correct. Especially. Correct. But so far it's doing okay and I'm watching the temps and we aren't creeping up in like anything above normal. So everything's okay for now. But I think for this weekend, I'll just power it down and, and maybe on Monday I can convince my daughter to, uh, to crack it open with me for old time's sake. So uh, shall we move on to Ken? Sure. All right. Ken asks... I say Ken asks. I can find it here. Ken uh, says, while setting up my new iMac with a clean install, I ran into a problem. Although messages showed with a flagged flagged mailbox, uh, although message. Oh, OK, I've got to I've got to put some grammar in here. Uh, although messages showed with a flag, the flagged mailbox itself was not shown. Setting my smart mailbox also did not work. If I open an email and close it, the message now does appear in the flagged mailbox. The flagged mailbox appeared once I opened a, a flagged message. And of course, it also appeared in my smart mailbox. But opening each flagged message is rather tedious. And I do not plan on doing that. Is there something I can do to fix this problem? Yeah, there is. Um, my guess is you migrated your mail over from your old machine or, or you did something. And in that process, mail's index didn't get updated properly. So as you're opening each message, it is updating the index for that message. You want to force mail to update its entire index. And we call that the M envelope index. Uh, honestly, I think the easiest way to do this is to launch Onyx, which we'll link to. Uh, it's a free piece of software that uh, anybody who's been listening for even a short period of time has heard us talk about uh, that lets you all sort all, lets you do all sorts of maintenance. And if you go into Onyx, go to maintenance, go to rebuilding, and then you'll see a little box for mails, mailboxes. You have two choices there. You can rebuild it or you can delete the existing index. I recommend deleting and letting mail rebuild it, uh, but you can you can choose whatever you like. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's my thoughts. You got any thoughts on this one, John? My thought is as follows. So while you were talking about this, I was curious, is a flag part of the message or is it part of something else? I, it is not part of the message. It is I like read may... or unread. 
All right, I'm looking at the spec for IMAP4, and it's RFC 3501. It may be an old one, but one of the attributes for a message is a flag thing. Now, it may be that that's independent, or nobody uses it, so what we are dealing with, that, that was my question, is that, you know, is does this data exist outside of, is that attribute saved on the IMAP server? And it oh, sounds like it, it could, could be. be, but... Yeah. No, I think it is. And in fact, I'm certain, well, it, it could be. And then I'm be. finding, I'm finding an server. attribute called flag. Yeah. And it's a data structure that you can attach to an email message. Right. And it's part of IMAP, but it's optional. So if they're using that, then, but the rebuild suggests that it got corrupted as everything does, which is yeah. why we're in business, right? Yeah, it's, it's right. a cache it's somewhere do do, right? or it's an index. It's exactly right. Same thing. They're old things that are, that are messed up and need to be fixed. <laughs> yeah. And the nice part about, I mean, the, the, that index is handy because otherwise mail would have to traverse through every message there. Mm. Every time it wanted to see if it should update the flagged mailbox, that's not efficient. So it builds this index and it, it, it assumes that the index is correct unless you go to a message and change it. Um, and that's, a, I mean, generally speaking, that's a safe assumption, but this is also why, just like you said, sometimes we have to delete caches and or indexes because they're not right. That's the beauty of something like Onyx. It's to do exactly those things. So, Hi, right, man. You want to take us to Edgar? Do I? Do you? Do I, do I really? You don't yeah, have to. We got lots of other questions. Okay. No, no. Edgar has a good one. And let me see. I think I can cut some of the beginning out here. Um, I'm going to tell you what Edgar's trying to do. So he's using photos and he wants to go through his system and identify potential important family and, and other type of photos, which of course are stored in image files. Um, but he doesn't want to get the cruft. Okay. So here's what he did, which I think is cool. And, and there's an overlap between them. So he did, um, I think he's creating a smart, Trying to create a smart album, which is kind of the same thing as doing a spotlight search in that you can make them do the same type of query. If you can go with me yeah. on this. Yeah, I'm with you. Sure. So right. I did it through the finder. He, he said he was doing it through uh, a smart folder. Sure. Or a smart album, but I, but I think there's an overlap between them. So um, here's the problem. So say you go into the finder and you do uh, command F and that brings up the, uh, a place where you can build a search. So number one, the search that was being sent, uh, being set up defaults, and this is kind of lame of fine, but it defaults to this Mac. You probably want to limit it. I, the first thing I would recommend is maybe clicking on your user folder because that's probably where most of the photos that you want are. That makes so sense. So change sure. the scope of it to that. Oh, yeah. Now the thing is then you can add, uh, all, right, all right, so number one, you don't want to search on this Mac because then you're going to get, and here's what he was getting, though he's getting it in both cases, is that you get stuff that are images like JPEGs or PNGs or stuff like that, but they're part of the operating system, like Evernote clips or this clip or that clip, and they're tiny little thumbnails and things you get in mail. And it's a nightmare. But they're in a predictable place. So the question he posed, well, well how do I kind of make the filter better? <sighs> and from what I've seen, Dave, the, uh, I don't have a full answer. So I'm going to click on, let me click on my folder here. I'm going to do a find. So right now, the, the first condition, so one, move it from this Mac to your user folder, and then kind is, an image is probably a good choice, but then here's what you can do as well. So if you click on that first menu, it lists the default things that you can select by. Well, there's an other type, and oh boy, there's a boatload of things here, Dave. And the thing is that I found something within the boat that sounded like a good condition to add, and the thing is, you don't want to go crazy because there's hundreds of these. There are a couple hundred, it looks like. You don't want to add them all to the default list, but you may want to add some. Now, there's one, Dave, called Document Container. And its description is Containing Folder of an Item. Now, most oh. of the things he was finding that were annoying were things that were in the library folder within his user folder. So there are folders that have things that probably have photos he wants, like his downloads folder or duh, his pictures folder. And maybe some others within his user folder, but not the library folder. Who cares what's in there? Sure. Those are not your personal photos in there, or, or at least not, probably not the ones you want. There may be thumbnails and, you know, pre-processed versions and stuff. So I was like, well, why don't you, you know, pick this choice and type library in there? And what should that do? 
I, I would think by the naming of it, it was it would exclude search results. That so are what, in the what was folder. the flat? What was the now? Now that you've explained it, just quickly summarize what that line says in the Finder search, like how you're excluding the library. So it says select a search attribute when you go to the when you click yep. on the the list of attributes and then you go on other. You can choose another one, and the name of this one is called Document Container, and its description in the list is containing folder of item. Okay. So you would think, well, you know, what if you got a thumbnail in the library folder? Well, exclude that from the search. Doesn't it sound like that's what this does? Well, the thing is, I got mixed reports. I searched online in in Apple and other support forums, and it's kind of a mixed bag. Some people are like, yeah, this worked great. Did exactly what it should. I don't see all the thumbnails and extraneous garbage. Um, I'm going to ask you one more time, though, because I'm I'm trying to do this and I'm totally missing it. So I'm here in the, the fine thing. Correct. Uh, All right. And I've, to get to this, I've gone in the finder to file find, right? Right. And then I have my little drop down that says I can search this Mac. And it right now, it just by default says kind is any. So how okay. am I telling it? I don't want to search in the library folder. All right. What you do is you go to kind. Yeah. You go to other. Oh, okay. You then click on. Uh was a document container and then click on that check mark and say, okay, now when you go to the kind menu, see, you get an additional category called document container. That's how you add. It, it's kind of a, not the best. Way oh, to add oh, I see. There. So I'm not choosing. Con- this is the problem. If you choose kind in the next menu, there is something called other and that's, what's throwing me off. So I am just going to that first menu and at the bottom I am choosing other and then adding document container to that list. I totally get it now. Thank you. Then you can have the two conditions. Kind is image and document container. Yeah. You can say is not. Right. There's a number of conditionals. And one could be is not library. Wouldn't you think that would exclude it? Well, it didn't for me. And it doesn't for a lot of people. But for some people it does. Because it's, we're telling it, probably telling it not to put it, not to show anything that's in the top level of the, the library folder. And I tried tilde slash library yeah, and library I tried the slash full star. Path. Yep. I mean, I tried thinking, you know, if I was a programmer, how would I do this? Would I parse it from the place that you're looking for everything else? Yeah. Uh, that, that'd be kind of a reasonable assumption. So this could be a mini geek challenge. This should do what, if, if your goal is to find your personal photos, this is probably the best way to go about it. Right. Short of that, my only suggestion was you're just going to have to do various smart folders in subfolders. So pictures, downloads, maybe documents. I don't know if, if you've put pictures in your documents folder or some of your apps have. Um, but yeah, you think you just got to make a, a... It's annoying because you shouldn't have to. I mean, it, it, it seems like the spotlight search parameters are pretty thorough. Yeah. You want them to be. So I thought I found one that sounded like it should do it, but it didn't. And it made me sad. And our listeners sad. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they just got to make a, a much more complicated and fragmented solution to this. Yeah, there's a... Um, that's there may be some search tools that are better. I, I saw some... Was it called a better finder? Finder? Find? Or no, was it a, some better... There may be some other more sophisticated search tools yeah. out there that could parse this sort of request. Well, and there's plugins. Because you know what it is. It's like, well, find all too. the well, find all the images that are probably photos that are important to me. Maybe there could be other ways. I saw in the search also, I think you can limit it if you dig in there, you can limit it by size. So maybe you want to say, okay, I don't want anything smaller than a hundred by a hundred, because it's probably not a photograph, right? Right. Or some threshold. Yeah, you gonna, know it's from your camera. I'm going to link to a Stack Exchange discussion about this because there's okay. a screenshot that talks about containing folder names. Um, and that seems like that's what we would want. But I think this is something they created and this person created and plugged in. So I'll put that in the uh, in the show notes because, you know, maybe maybe there's something there. So, Yeah. Yeah, I like this stuff. Yeah, there's yeah. there's an answer here. We're we're close on this one, man. Huh? 
I want to find yes. an easy answer. I mean, I could write a database, you know, query. And, and mm. <laughs> well, you could do it with a find command in the finder, but man, that's not fun. So, yeah. All right. Well, I'll link. We'll link to that. We'll we'll dig in, mm-hmm. or maybe one of you will. So, yeah, good stuff. Hey, um, you know what I want to do? I want to talk about our three sponsors. Is that uh, does that work for you, my friend? Excellent. All right. Our first sponsor for today is Smile at SmileSoftware.com with their PDF Pen family. You can edit PDFs like a pro with all of these tools in the family. PDF Pen for macOS for iPad and iPhone and PDF pen scan plus. So PDF pen for Mac OS is the ultimate PDF editing tool. It is your Swiss army knife of PDF. Anything you need to do to a PDF. This is the tool you want. PDF pen for iPad and iPhone brings you a lot of that same functionality. The stuff you need to your mobile devices. I have literally used PDF pen for iPhone to sign a contract that actually is still in place with, uh, with us at Backbeat Media today with one of our publishers standing in the queue waiting to get on an airplane in like Chicago or somewhere, maybe St. Louis, actually. I think it was St. Louis. This works anywhere. That's the beauty of it. PDF Pen Scan Plus. This app's awesome. I use this all the time. You know, I do these theater shows. They give me a book. I want to use it on my iPad. I can, in five minutes, scan a hundred page book with PDF Pen Scan Plus because I don't have to tap the button every time I get on a page. It auto detects the page, snaps the picture, and then I just flip the page. It's freaking awesome. Break the scan, print, sign, fax cycle with the PDF Pen family. Do it all paperless style. Check out smilesoftware.com slash geek to learn all about the PDF pen family, including a cool case study they did with Tim Ferriss of the four hour work week fame. Check it out. Smilesoftware.com slash geek. Our thanks to smile for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor for today is a new one. It is care.com where at care.com slash MGG, you can save 30% off of a premium membership. Now, What is care.com? They are the world's largest online destination for finding and managing care. And they help millions of families find high quality care for their loved ones and their pets, to be perfectly honest. You know, one in 10 people over the age of 65 has Alzheimer's disease. My grandfather had Alzheimer's disease. He, um, I I think listeners know this. My grandfather was the guy who invented those oval shaped binocular viewing machines. You know, that you see it, all the tourist traps and everything. That was him. It sucked when he got Alzheimer's. I mean, it sucks for anybody to get Alzheimer's. What sucked even worse is we had no idea as a family what to do. And so we wound up putting him in a nursing home because that's what we could figure out at the time. We didn't have care.com to go and research our options. And with that, I really think we might have been able to keep him home longer and all of that good stuff. The best thing to do is to be informed. So visit care.com and when you visit, go to care.com slash MGG because that gets you 30% off of a uh, premium membership there. And that's what you're going to want because when someone in your family gets older, they probably are going to want to stay independent at home with care.com. You can find the personalized care that they need staying in the comfort of their own home You can find help with meals and errands and housekeeping and transportation, all of that stuff. And in many cases, hiring an in-home senior caregiver saves you money. So you got to check this out. It's beautiful what the internet lets us do, man. Research, research, research. Go to care.com slash MGG and figure it out. Perhaps do it now before, you know, you're in a pressure situation. Our thanks to care.com at care.com slash MGG for supporting this episode. I have become addicted to our third sponsor, and that is Harry's. We're at harrys.com slash MGG. You can get a free trial shave set from them. You pay three bucks in shipping, and they send you this awesome shave set. It includes a razor handle, blades for the razor, lathering shave gel, and even a travel cover 
which they didn't use to include. These things are awesome. It's like, <laughs> it's fantastic. I, I got to be honest, though. Like I said, I'm addicted. There's nothing that gets me a closer shave than this. I never cut myself. Like, it's just the way it should be. They got five blades per cartridge there that you put on your razor. And these things are inexpensive. You can get them for two bucks or less for a replacement, depending on how many you buy. You can sign up for a subscription so that they just show up when you need them. Or you can just buy a la carte. You don't have to do one or the other. It's totally up to you. I've actually signed up for the subscription. You know, I'm somebody that like I'm always hesitant about that stuff. But I found over time, I know the pacing that I'm buying these things. So I signed up for a subscription and then they just show up when I need them. It's, It's awesome. Their lathering shave gel. You know, I, I used to be super gaga about the cream that they have. And I still am. It is. It's like silk in your fingers and silk on your face. Whatever they've done to their lathering shave gel, though, has made that stuff delicious. I don't mean delicious to eat. I mean delicious on your skin. It's just, it's thick and foamy. You got to check this out. Go to harrys.com slash MGG right now. They'll send you this set. You pay three bucks to have it shipped to you. Harrys.com slash MGG. Our sincere thanks to Harry's for sponsoring this show and for keeping me nice and clean shaven. I like it. It's good stuff. Our thanks to Harry's for sponsoring the episode. All right. Now it's time to go back to Facebook. We're in our Facebook group at MacGeekGab.com slash Facebook. Ari asks about VPNs. He says, my understanding is that I can use a VPN to accomplish three things. Number one, protecting my network traffic while I'm out in the world. Number two, tunneling back into my home network while I'm away to mount my network drives or do other things. And three, tunneling all my home traffic through a VPN to add an additional layer of security to my home network. I have a Synology RT 2600 AC and a disk station 416 play at home with Synology VPN plus set up on the router. So far, I'm only able to figure out how to do number one, protecting my traffic when I'm out in the world by logging into my Synology.me account through a browser. The other two, I still can't quite sort out any advice. Yeah, uh, you're totally right. Those are three things. I think there's probably other things you can do with a VPN. You could connect two offices together and tunnel them like they're on one network and things like that. But but in, in essence, you're do, you're doing the same thing. You just have different purposes um, with your Synology router. Really, number one and number two are, are kind of the same thing. Uh, if you can connect to your router when you're out in the world, you should be able to connect and see things on your local network. Sometimes in the configuration of Synology's um, VPN stuff, you have a choice of setting up a different IP range to be assigned to the the VPN traffic so that it is isolated from your local network. For what you're talking about, that's not what you want. Uh, You want your VPN range to be a part of your local network and... uh, and, and so perhaps that's what you haven't set here. If you go in on your Synology router and you go into the VPN plus server, when you're configuring things, um, you know, like their standard VPN, uh, you can you have an option for client IP range and you can set that to local network or default. Change it to local network. That will likely give you what you're looking for. And, yep. Uh, like the one that I did. So specifically for OpenVPN, because I struggled with this too. I'm like, so number one, when you're trying to access network drives, your best bet to make it as simple as possible is try the IP address first. Mm. Yes, it does have a local name and yes, it has a broadcast name and yes, it probably has a Windows name or a Wins name. And a, Try the IP address first. Yeah. Seriously. Um, number two, and I learned this, so the thing is I do uh, 172.16.1 for my local uh, home network. And at least for OpenVPN, you got to give it a hint as to the range. And so I set the IP addresses for the VPN devices at 172.16.2. Whatever. Yeah, because so Open, OpenVPN won't let you uh, create a local. It won't let you connect to the local range, which is sort of a drag. You're, you're better off. Yeah. 
but using that's something how I, like L2TP because it's well, built no. into your. No, no, no. He is. It's built into his router okay. and it's built into his. But I won't because I figured out how to get this to work. So I'm not going to give that up. Right. But <laughs> but it, it it's simpler to use something that's built into. Okay. So it automatically. Your, um, yeah. But just let me finish one thing and then you can go. Mm-hmm. Open VPN is not built into your Mac or your iPhone. You need a third party mm-hmm. app to do it. L2TP is built into your Mac and your iPhone. So you're much better off just going with sure. that. And then you don't need to worry about mm-hmm. configuring a third party app or any of that stuff. There's nothing wrong with open VPN. It's just not as well supported. So that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now you can go. I'm good. Yeah. Well, no, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, and when you're configuring open VPN on your router, make sure you check the box that says, allow clients to access the servers LAN because that's right. what that's going to let you do what you're doing. Now, uh, on your Synology router, you also have the option to uh, VPN outbound. Uh, and that is in the, uh, on your router, it's in network center, internet connection, VPN settings, where you can create an outbound VPN tunnel to any third party, well, most third party VPN services. It supports open VPN, L2TP and, and PPTP. I wouldn't use PPTP. It's not secure at all. Uh, but the others are, or, or generally are. So uh, here's the issue. I've And I haven't tried this in a, in a while, but I heard of people having trouble doing all three of these things simultaneously. You could either do inbound VPN or outbound VPN, but not both simultaneously on the same router. Uh, so, well, I, but it's worth trying and see, you know, you'll be able to test that out pretty quick. So, but yeah, that's what a VPN is for. And I agree with you, John, using the IP to connect to your local resources when they're remote is way better than trying to like fight with DNS issues and things like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's pretty much uh, the reaction from the uh, peanut gallery here at, um, in our chat room at MacGeekGab.com slash stream. Right. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We love the... Uh, I don't know if we've acknowledged them, but... Um, we may not have. At least one of the members says, yes, IP is best. And, it is. Well, it's just simplest, especially when you're testing. Once you once you know how it's working, then you can kind of get a little more advanced. But, you know, it's a little crazy. So... All right. Shall we, uh, shall we move on here? I guess. All right. We have a question from Nitin, who says, I have an iMac at home with two users set on it. I would like to access my iMac from outside the house. What's the best application to do this? I was looking at team viewer or screens. Will, uh, will that let other, the other user continue to use the iMac while I log into it from outside using my user account? So team viewer will not let you do that. Team viewer completely uh-huh. takes over the screen. Oh, all right. right. It's it, when you're local and connecting to another Mac, you can, um, you can, you get to choose when you log in, if you're log, if you want to log in as the currently active user or as yourself behind the scenes. And I do that all the time here in the house. It's great. Team viewer doesn't do that. Team viewers take over the screen only Adobe screens will let you do that. Um, and at least when I've tested it, it has, and it, it tends to work really, really well. So, uh, and Adobe screens lets you, it will poke the appropriate holes in your firewall to let you in from the outside world. I've, I've had trouble with, with team viewer, John, and maybe I'm just using it wrong. In fact, mm. I'm sure I am. Oh yeah. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> where I try to connect and it says, okay, I'm just waiting to get permission from the locally logged in user. It's like, no, I'm yeah. not, I'm not there. How do I give myself permission when I'm far away? Thanks, man. I- Hey, have you, is that, is, am I just doing it wrong or is that how team? I think you're doing is? something wrong in that okay. there, there should be a universal, I think it's called quick setup. So they okay. have, the, that's the easiest thing for the person on the other end to run. They basically run it. No, 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 I'm not talking. You're right. I'm not talking about when there's someone sitting there. I'm talking about when I'm at your house and I want to log into my Mac and nobody's in my office. Right. I've had a, I've had the problem where team viewer says, uh, yep. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the local user to say, okay. And it's like, yeah, but nobody's oh. there, man. Okay. I haven't, 
uh, I don't know if it's meant for that. Right. I, and that's what I'm saying. Is something there has like to be somebody there to acknowledge the request from a security point of view, which I, I understand. Right. Okay. So uh, Andy in the chat room is saying, yes, you can change that in team viewer settings and, and you can configure a pin to override. That. Okay. Cause so. everybody gets, yeah, every session is managed through them and is a user or, or, or a like a nine digit code and then a pin and then you can connect and it brokers the whole discussion initially. Uh yeah. right? Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once yeah, once you do that, it works great. Yeah, it's it's easy as long as somebody's there to, to let you in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I I have one. Yeah, man. Go. I haven't used it in ages, Dave, but it's free and it's built in. And it's called Back to My Mac. What is that? Oh, it's part of iCloud. True. And it lets you do two things remotely. And it uses underneath the covers. I, I don't know why I don't currently use it. Maybe I'll, just to geek out and try other things. Sure. And it maybe not. It's dependent. It, it would seem to be that it is dependent on you having Apple equipment to make it work properly. But you got to have an iCloud account. You have to have multiple machines. You got to enable it on the various machines. And you'll see it in settings. It's something called back to my Mac. And it's like, okay. And then you got to enable some other sharing things. It really wants you to have an airport so it can do the port mappings. Because I assume it uses this stupid NAT PMP thing. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. And you need airport utility to, I think, fiddle with some other aspects of this as well. Because I think there's a menu in the airport that you have to say, yes, enable back to my Mac. Just thought I'd mention it. If you want to do file sharing or screen sharing, Back to My Mac is something that you can do, and we'll link to an article that tells you all about it. Yeah, but I, I haven't I, used it in ages, to be honest, Dave. I have two major problems with Back to My Mac. Okay. Number one is that, uh, and it's ironic that these two questions were back-to-back, -back, but uh, Back to My Mac uses an L2TP VPN, and so it... Which is the the bad one no it's a great yeah. one it's oh, that's so the better great one. in fact that that's the one that i use <laughs> on my router but if any computer in my house has back to my mac running it will commandeer those ports from the outside world and i can no longer connect with my vpn so it wants to run so it breaks your vpn yeah okay. it breaks that's my nice. vpn that's, that's nice. yeah it's real sexy i love it and then uh the other reason that i don't use back to my mac you know, Apple makes these iPads with beautiful screens that work really well for like, you know, having to reconnect to a computer and do some like simple stuff. Back to my Mac doesn't work on iOS. There's no client. Zilch. Huh? No way to connect from your iPhone or your iPad. Thanks, guys. All right. So, that's why I don't use back to my Mac. Those well, in that case, reasons. all right. So what have we talked about? Team viewer. We talked about messages. What was it? Screens. screens. Screens from Adobe. Uh, yeah. What else is there? Um, um, oh, kind of in the vein of iCloud, but there's there's hmm. yes. Well, no. I, uh, what's the proper name for it? I haven't used this in ages either. But um, uh, messages, messages, whatever. Screen share with with the oh, with messages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that needs the person on the other end to like invite I, you. In. Okay. All right. So we yeah. want to focus on. Yeah. Yeah, it's not good. It's not good. Well, VNC, you know. Well, yeah, right. Actually, I do a lot of this. So here's. Well, you could just I, I don't the use, screen sharing. I mean. I don't use I mean, any of these things. I, yeah, I use screen sharing. And what I do is I VPN myself back in. And then <laughs> I use screen sharing to then connect. You acknowledge your, <laughs> and then you acknowledge your own dialogues. No, I VPN in oh. and then I can screen share oh, right. however I want. And the cool part is the screens app for iOS will let me screen share to my Mac. So I don't need to run anything special. I just, I mean, I run the app on my iPhone, but it's otherwise it's just straight up screen sharing and it works great. I love it. it it's, you know, I couldn't live without that screens app. It's killer. Mm -hmm. It's really well done. Huh? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go to, let's go to Joseph. Joseph has, uh, he's got a, he's got a tip for us. I think Joseph says, I wanted to uh, send you what I think is an update to the behavior of disabling the documents and desktop syncing setting in iCloud drive on a Mac. I went in on my Mac settings, iCloud, iCloud drive and disabled documents and desktop syncing. 
And unlike many of the things I've read, my files were not wiped from my Mac. Instead, I was given the option to have them move to an iCloud Drive archive folder, which was created in my user folder. I could then easily move my files from that folder back to my documents folder, which is not syncing, and I'm back in business with it now disabled. So that's, I like that. And I think he's right. I had never seen it do that before. So for anybody who's currently in the scenario where you're syncing them and maybe it's using too much storage or for whatever reason, you don't want to do it anymore. Uh, it sounds like this will keep you from, you know, losing everything when you turn that off. Yeah. yeah. So that's good. That's yeah. Good. Well, really what application and operating system developers should stop doing is putting up these terrifying dialogues saying you're going to lose everything if you click on this OK button. Well, unless you're going to lose everything and then that's a great dialogue to have. Well, there should be like a, a backup button like a right. nah, I didn't really mean it. Right. Or, well, cancel, but um, or an option to say, hey, you know, maybe I'll put some of that somewhere else or yeah, maybe there is a way to undo it. Why are you being so insistent on destroying everything? I mean, come on. <laughs> what are you driving at? It just seems much more reasonable to give people a, a, you know, a way to gently back out. Yeah, I like it. Not being so dramatic about it. Hey, so in our Facebook group, listener Mike uh tells a tale of woe uh, oh. he he was having some issues with his super drive and it died uh and he had updated to the latest os ran all the disk utilities onyx to make sure the machine was good everything checked out um then he returned it's his, it's a macbook pro 2012 and when he tried to log in it said wrong password tried it caps lock yada yada <sighs> nothing wouldn't let him in oh tried to log into another account Nothing was available. He said, so he did a power button restart. Couldn't figure out anything else. He relaunched into safe mode. Everything seemed to be fine. He assumed that the start into safe mode fixed whatever the problem was. So he restarted and the progress bar stopped halfway for about 30 minutes. He had to power it down again. He then restarted again in safe mode. And this time chose his clone. He uses carbon copy cloner to clone his boot drive. Chose his clone to boot from booting on the clone. Everything was fine. He ran disk utility on the main drive, checked his files. Things look good. He then went into settings to choose his internal drive for startup, and it wasn't there. He could see it on his desktop, but couldn't see it as an option for startup. So he shut down the MacBook, unplugged the clone so it wasn't able to boot from that, restarted, took a little while to find the OS, but it did launch, and the launch was perfect. Then he decided to run EtraCheck, which is a system checking utility he said, and it showed some system launch demons that failed and some launch agents that failed. And in the other apps section, some other things had failed too. And he was really worried about the system launch agents that failed. So he wound up going through a process where he wiped his drive, reinstalled everything, migrated. And before he, re before he did anything else, he ran EtraCheck again. It showed him the same errors. And so the lesson that Mike wants to share with us is two things. Number one, make sure your diagnostic software is up to date because it turns out this copy of EtraCheck that he had was older than his operating system. And so it was reporting some errors because things are different from OS to OS. Now, to be fair, the people who write EtraCheck should probably have thrown up a dialogue saying, you know, we don't know how we're going to work with, you know, a future version of the OS. But it didn't. And uh, and as listener John pointed out in, in the comments as well, it's good to know what normal looks like. And I know we say this a lot here, but, you know, he chose to run EtraCheck after uh, several bouts of troubleshooting, which is fine. I mean, it's good to use every tool at your disposal. But if you don't know if he had run this when his system was running fine, it would have shown exactly the same errors because he was using an old version. So there's a lesson here, right, John, that you want to know what normal looks like. It's just like looking at the console only when you have a problem. If you don't know what normal looks like there, you're going to think you have like that your system, you might as well just throw it away and get a new one. But that's not the case necessarily. <sighs> don't so, do that. Don't do that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Of course. But I'm glad he had a clone. There's that. So. Yeah. 
Well, you could have also reset the admin password. Which is, I mean, well, I mean, once he once he booted that way, it worked fine. Yeah. His his system was fine. He just, you know, then decided to run EtraCheck and uh-huh. and it it sent him down a rabbit hole that he didn't need to go down. Which is that's the that's the frustrating part. But that's how it goes. Yeah. Well, hey, man, I just went through a bout of upgrading all my tools. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, little snitch. Uh, well, Drive Genius, they hooked us up. Right. It's nice. Right. Um, Carbon Copy Cloner. I want the in here. Pretty, uh, pretty much anything that, well, no, there were like three things. Updates prepping for High Sierra, I assume, right? Yeah, and the new file system. So, um, oh, some, yeah. Well, I think both Drive Genius and uh, Carbon Copy Cloner advertise support. So I got those. And Little Snitch. Actually, it's nicer. The, uh, the dialogues are a lot cleaner in the new version. I'm happy with that too. In little snitch, yeah, I like mm-hmm. the new. I, yeah, I like the new little snitch. That's great. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, that's true. It's um, it's worth being very thoughtful about um what you run on your system here, especially things like you said, like carbon copy cloner and anything that's that's doing things with the disk. And little snitch is doing stuff at the network level, or you know, kind of at the kernel level with the network. You want things that are explicitly capable of running with high Sierra, especially high Sierra with that new file system. In 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 many cases, not all, but in many cases, your system's just going to be auto upgraded to that, just like your iPhone was. And you want to make sure you've got tools that can help you once it is. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. Hey, uh, you know, I'm a, uh, I think we both are big fans of amazing mini John. And, uh, I did. I mean, I had a. The thing is, I notice every day it says it backs things up. Yeah. I really haven't dug into it, though it can provide a wealth of information about your devices. So I got that out of my system. But apparently, you found something new and interesting. Oh, uh, not necessarily. Well, it's interesting. Um, or I, new to you. I, well, I noticed that my battery was dying like crazy on my iPhone. And so, where were you getting? At, uh, how long before it, you had to recharge? Oh, I wasn't making it a full day. If, if I was, but I finally sorted out, I thought it was the iOS 11 beta, right? And so, okay, fine. No big deal. No big deal. Uh, and then I realized, no, you know, when I'm not in my office, my battery, or when I'm not at home, my battery's fine. So something about being home is the problem. And then it hit me. iMazing Mini is backing up this phone every day. And I realized it's backing it up in the middle of the day. And perhaps is doing lots of things with my phone in the middle of the day when it's not plugged in and is just constantly talking to it. So I quit iMazing Mini for a day and things got better. So, but then I dug in, I I was going to write them and say, hey, but I figured before I write them with a bug report, I should dig into the settings and see, you know, if there's a way I can fix this myself. And I think I have fixed it. If I go and you can do this too. If you go into iMazing Mini, uh, choose the device that you want, go to the settings for it and go to the backup settings Uh, in there. You can set a minimum battery level at below which it will not charge. And I think mine was set at like, you know, 20 or 30% or something, which would still cause it to, to wear down. So I now set it to charging. Like it has to be on charging. Otherwise it will not back up. And that's what I want. You know, I'm backing up to iCloud anyway, so it's not like I need daily backups at home, even though I have it set to daily. But if for some reason it doesn't happen, that's okay. But now it should only back up when I'm charging at night. And I think I've solved my problem. It's possible it's entirely something else. And who knows, maybe maybe it is iOS 11 and, you know, with a, a semi-weak cell signal here at the house, maybe it's, you know, being overly over-aggressive and, and burning its battery down that way. That, that's entirely possible. Well, as but, you taught me, you could look in your cellular menu and make sure things aren't grabbing cellular when you don't want them to, because I think that consumes relatively more power than the Wi-Fi's. Right, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when your phone has a weak cell. It, it's not. It's not that it's grabbing cell when I don't want to. It's that it's hunting actively. If you if you're on a very strong cell cell signal, your phone will lose use less battery. 
then it will, if you're on a, okay. Otherwise it's looking for, for a better signal. Correct. It's constantly Uh, searching. Yeah. 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 So it's possible that's what's happening. And it's just, you know, iOS 11 is searching more frequently, but I don't think that's it. I, my gut says that I've solved it with this amazing mini thing. Unfortunately, I only solved it uh, earlier today, so I won't know for, you know, a couple of days. Actually, I'm going to be away for a couple of days. So who knows? I'll find out next week. I'll let you know. We'll follow up. I like that it tells you the estimated milliamp hours. Uh, yeah, let's see what it calls it here. Battery effective max charge. My iPhone currently, it says 1840 with the uh, design being 1950. So that's not bad. 94%. Hmm. That's not bad. Yeah, that's good. Hey, John, I want to take a minute and thank all of our premium subscribers. We yes, thank you for for those of you who don't know. Uh, this show supported in two ways. The sponsors that that you've heard us talk about uh, and you supporting them and, and visiting their sites via the links that they provide uh, and all of that makes a huge difference. I, I can't stress enough how big of a difference that makes. Uh, so if, uh, if you have a moment and you can go and visit our sponsors and check them out, especially if it's via our special links, they really appreciate that. We don't get paid per click or anything, but it does show them that you're interested in, and that, that means a lot. Um, and then I I was going to say, I don't, I, it depends on the month, which one is more important. I I don't want to say more important, uh, which one is more valuable to us, but certainly uh, those of you that support us via uh, our premium program, which is direct support, make up a huge portion of what it takes for John and I to be able to do this show. And you can learn all about that at MacGeekab.com slash premium if you like. And one of the things that you premium folks get access to, is, in addition to the warm, fuzzy feeling of supporting your two favorite geeks, is our premium at MacGeekab.com address, where we prioritize responses to you and uh, and really try to you know, go a little bit further for you because uh, you're helping us keep the lights on. And we appreciate that. So I want to go through and thank those of you uh, whose contributions came through this week on the monthly $10 uh, plan. We have Michael L, Bob P, Jason A, Rob with two B's and an H, Ward J, Jim E, Elizabeth B, Dave C, and Chris F. Thanks to all of you. You rock. And on the biannual plan, we have one new one from Drake Z, and then renewals from Eric W, Seth R, Mary G, Gene R, Anthony B, Jeff S, Douglas S, Daniel C, Bruce W, maybe it's that Bruce W, Randall S, Bartek B, Brooks V, and Jonathan C. Thank you so much. You all, it really means a lot. Uh, Everybody that's a premium member, and uh, you know, I, I know I always say it, uh, but everybody just listening, contributing, and your questions and all of that stuff, it makes a huge difference here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. you the rock. other thing that helps, Dave, yeah, man. is, um, so, you know, when something gets on our nerves here and something, you know, a great injustice has been done in the user community, we also enjoy your finger wags and your fish shakes. The energy of those get projected to apple to make them do the right thing it's it's true (laughs) yeah you know we've seen that like it's not just to apple it's to anything that that any wrong that needs any vendor or or force that has wronged you yeah yeah no we we can collectively wave our fingers and uh uh, wag our fingers and (laughs) and shake our fists and and it it matters it's actually really impressive we've had a actually some great discussions in the facebook community uh, where, you know, we've had vendors come in and join the, the thing and, and make some, mm-hmm. make it, make a real difference. It's, it's been great. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Right. Now, All you right. It was the, you mean like the Bruce and the action movies? I, it might be. I just, I don't know. I don't want to divulge his identity. Cool. Yeah, that's right. Hey, uh, listener Ian wrote in, actually he, he was out there on Facebook and, uh, he says a quick little tip based on an experience I had today with Apple care at a local store. The tip is take and store photos of items that you plan to cover under warranty. He says, I have a work MacBook pro that shuts off randomly and I took it in to be checked last week. Genius stated that the laptop was out of warranty. My company purchases a three-year Apple care and I believed it was bought in 2015, i.e. two years ago. 
The Apple Care database showed it was over three years ago. I did some research at work and was provided paperwork showing a December 2015 purchase date, but it did not have the serial number documented. And when I arrived at the Apple store, I realized my office provided me the invoice for another person's machine. The genius was helpful and made calls to clarify the warranty status. Uh, unfortunately, the calls were not able to help. Then I remember I took photos of the box when I got the machine and stored them in Evernote. I launched Evernote in a web browser. The genius and I looked for that note for a time date stamp, and we were not able to find a suitable date as the note was created to validate when it was purchased. The genius then said it would be nice if we could tell when the box picture was taken. And I had an aha moment. I quickly dragged the image to the desktop and opened get info in the finder. The genius found that the image was taken with an iPhone, but no confirmation of the date of the image. I did a quick search for see exif data online and found a site to help. I dragged, dragged, the, dragged the image onto the browser and the genius looked over the exif results to confirm my MacBook Pro was within the three-year warranty. He says, although I have to wait one more week for the thing to be fixed, I am excited that this particular picture is worth a thousand dollar savings. That's pretty cool. It's cool that Apple like would take EXIF data to, to validate a warranty. I mean, it's obviously it wasn't just EXIF data. It was this whole uh, this whole thing. But uh, but that's that's good advice, Ian. I like it, man. Pretty cool, huh, John? It is useful to carry digital versions of important things with you. I had this happen the other day. I was I've been visiting my bank for various reasons as sure. of late. And one thing is that I set up something new with with my local bank. And so, but it, it's literally within walking distance, which is kind of nice. Sure. And bankers are for the most part, good people. Yeah. Um, and they have free coffee. So, um, but I went there one time to set up something and, you know, I brought some you know, financial instruments with me and we were going to set up a, a new type of account. And he's like, yeah, do you have your, um, but the thing is I was leaving my house and it's local. So I'm like, yeah, I don't need my wallet. Oh, I just brought my car keys, which, you know, no requirement to carry your wallet with you. And so I'm there, but I also brought my phone with me. And so I was at the bank and he's like, yeah, so we're setting up this new type of account. Well, the one type of ID, you know, you got this account with us already. So that's a form of ID. He's like, do you have your driver's license? I'm like, oh man. <laughs> then I remembered I stored it in LastPass. Yeah. And I'm like, here's the image. And he's like, okay, I just needed, because he had that info for some reason. He just needed but it was to confirm old. it. Sure. Well, he didn't have the latest, it was an old expiration date. I guess when I open an account, they're like, yeah, you got a driver's license. I'm like, yeah, here it is. And they had the operator number and all that, but they didn't have, uh, but it was expired of course, sure. as far as they were concerned. So he's like, well, do you have your current one? I'm like, yeah, hold on. It took a while to download it because huh. there was either something with my Wi-Fi or their server, or whatever. Oh, but it got sure, there eventually. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yep, here's the digital version. Does that work? And he's like, yeah. He's yeah. Like, I've hey. heard, I mean, we've talked about it on the show before where I've heard of people using, uh, you know, if they've gotten pulled over or whatever, if they need to show their license and they don't have it with them, I've, we've heard of people. We can't guarantee that every officer on the planet is going to accept this, but but we certainly have heard of people uh, who have had that experience where it's like, oh yeah, here you go, then it's fine. Uh, or you know, they say, yep, that's good enough for now. You know, bring your license, your actual license, by the station tomorrow or wh whatever. But yeah, I keep copies of all that stuff uh, in. I do it in one password, but it, you know, it's the same kind of thing. I keep passports and my license and all of that stuff. Why not? You know, it's awesome. I like it. Pictures worth a thousand dollars. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, in this case for Ian, it certainly was. All right. Uh, it, okay. So listener, Peter did something pretty cool. He built an Apple script that I mean, it's an, it's an app, but he built it in Apple script and he posted it to our Facebook group. So you can go and download this and he keeps it up to date. In fact, I think he just updated it earlier today, uh, twice in fact. And what it's built to do is check to make sure your internet connection is alive and well, and it logs the result to a file. So, uh, and he's built the app to ping three addresses each time it runs and it'll, it'll keep running and you can, you know, cron it or however you want to do it. Uh, an external IP to check, to see if it can connect all the way out to something, you know, not in your house, the routers IP to make sure that you can connect to the router and then another computer's local IP. So you could be in a scenario where your, your internet connection itself is down 
uh, but the router and obviously your local network are working fine, it would show you that because you'd have the external one reporting is down and the other two reporting is up. Uh, you could be in a scenario where your router is down, uh, but your local network is still OK because there's another machine or device that it's pinging. And that way you'd get one response and not the other two. So it's pretty cool, pretty cool little thing. And you can go download it. So I guess it's uh, cool stuff f- created. Uh, and he just added support for IPv6 addresses, too. So it's pretty cool. I like it. Thank you, Peter. You rock, man. That's pretty nice. good stuff. I know. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I had an outage the other day. Did you? It was actually, I was watching Netflix, and I'm like, and all of a sudden, it like was stuttering and getting pixelated, which sometimes happens, but then all of a sudden, it stopped, and the TiVo was like, whoa, man, there's something wrong. Sure. And I'm like, okay, run all the tests, and it's like, okay, uh, nothing's working. Oh. Then I looked up, and I noticed that the, the little light on the Eero, which is under my TV, was red. Ah, all right. Hmm. Temporary outage. Yeah. Came back in like a minute. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> The red light should I should have seen sooner, but I was driven to run the diagnostics. Sure, of the, uh, no. <laughs> of the box. But, uh. Huh. I have I have changed my local network here, you know, because I'm always testing different mm-hmm. things and doing it different ways. So I now I decommissioned temporarily anyway the Linksys Velop system that I had running in bridge mode, and now hmm. am running the Eero Gen Two system in bridge mode here. Oh uh, yeah, with the beacons, right? Yeah, I have one beacon as part of it, too. But, you know, like you could run a beacon. It The, the beacons, all, everything is compatible with each other. And, man, I got to tell you, they did a beautiful thing. I um, I wanted to, I, I, I tried this. I went over to my dad's yesterday and I took one of the new, he has a, a three Gen 1 Euros over there. And so I took one of the gen twos over. And I, I wanted to make that his router because it's, it's actually faster and it's a better router. Uh, and so what I did is I just added it as a satellite to his system. And so it was fine. So he had four up and running and then I unplugged the one that was acting as a router, took the new gen two one, plugged it in and boom, it became the router. I didn't have to like all the settings were everywhere. I didn't have to do anything magic. And then I plugged the other one in and, and, you know, the old router one and, and took it off his system. So it wasn't looking for it and reporting that it was missing and all that. So, yep. So it was like presto changeo. It was presto changeo, dude. Yup. So apparently it sucked the configuration out of one of the satellites and said, oh, I'm the new one. Well, I had already added it. So by that point, it was a satellite, right? It was acting as a satellite. And so everything has every configuration. It's, it's smart. It's how it should be. Okay. I misunderstood what you did. Yeah. Which I, what I just said would work. Maybe, maybe not. No, it, uh, uh, Eh, probably not. No, because you, you, it would, but you need internet access to do it. Right. You need internet access to add your Eero. So I wouldn't, you could, if you had like. So they could push, if they detect something's change, you could say, push my yeah. old configuration. To yeah. 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 It was pretty cool. I mean, it was seamless. It took, you know, whatever, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. It was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so I like that. It's uh, they are. I ch- and, and my links is Velop in bridge mode. I disconnected the ethernet cables from two of them. One of them evidently was the one that it had decided was the master. It like won't reconfigure itself. It's just like, nope, network's down. It's like, no, but one of you is still plugged in. That nope. should, that should be okay. Like that's what nope. bridge mode. Is. It's like, nope, the master one isn't plugged in. Like what happens if the master one dies or the ethernet cable gets chewed? Like, isn't the point to be robust? Yeah. I, I guess not for the Linksys folks. I'll link to a discussion on the Linksys forums about that. <laughs> Um, because it's, you know, well, it's like their exhaust port, you know, that's the thing they, they can't, hand, they just can't handle that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, migrating to gen two of the era was cake. So, uh, yeah, it's good. All right. Uh, we have a couple of tips and I think we've got time to go through these listener, Neil, uh, relating to last show where we were talking about contacts and uh, creating a contact group. He says, I have a suggestion. Uh, 
It should be relatively easy to write an Apple script for this purpose to slurp all of the email addresses out of a message and create a contact group with them. He says, I say should because there are certainly some things that sh really should be easy enough to do via the scripting interface, but just aren't. Uh, anyway, my solution would be accomplished via scripting since heavy text manipulation should not be needed. I'd probably go with Apple script, especially since there are way more code samples out there for scripting mail and contacts via Apple script than for something like JavaScript. I would use Apple script to obtain the selected message in mail, then grab every recipient of that message as desired. You could choose to include CCs and BCCs or not, or even have a dialogue up to ask for preferences, depending on the need. Once you have the recipients, you can then have contacts, create a new group again, depending on need. Then using the recipient list, create each new contact and add it to the group. And I think that, I mean, that's a, that's actually a pretty good piece of advice. Apple script should be able to do all that because it can talk with mail uh, pretty robustly. It can talk with contacts pretty robustly. So that would be another solution to that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Neil. It's good stuff, man. It's easy to forget that Apple script is there as evidenced by Apple sometimes forgetting that it's there, but you know. Should what, be what's right. there? What? what? Huh? James has a little tip for us again from show 672. We were talking, we started the show by talking about multiple monitors. And James says, like John, I have a Mac mini to which I have added a second monitor. He says, I did it using the HDMI port of an other world computing Thunderbolt 2 dock, which would work just fine too. Thunderbolt devices have their own video and it can easily do that. So it's good to remember Thunderbolt can be, can be your friend when it comes to time for expansion. Your Mac mini is not Thunderbolt capable though. Is that right, John? That is. Mm. I don't know what, I don't you know, know what mm means. It's a, I'm is, looking... isn't that a yes or no question or no? Well, that's a difficult question. Okay. Well, I'm looking. No, I'm looking at Mac Tracker, so I'll explain what I'm babbling about here because I had another kind of follow-up question here. So the thing is, as you know, I said I'm using an HDMI port and the Display Port slash Thunderbolt port. And huh. my question was, is a Thunderbolt port a Display Port? And the answer is yes. Uh, is a Thunderbolt port a display port? A mini display port and that they're the same shape. The thing is, I have something plugged into the display port or Thunderbolt port on my mini, which I think are the same thing. And yeah, so Thunderbolt video. 2 goes Thunderbolt 1 and Thunderbolt 2 communicate over mini display port. But that does not mean that every mini display port port is Thunderbolt capable. Um, well, I was kind of asking the other question. The other question, yeah. Thunderbolt in port a potential video port. Um, so I'm using it now for display and not for, for that's not trans. necessarily the case. It is every max Thunderbolt port. Every max mini display port is mini display port. Right. Okay. But, but it, there are, I, it is possible to create a Thunderbolt dock that does not support video over mini over that interface. I think that's okay. a really good question though. Huh? Yeah, I mean, trying what I did here was easy. I'm like, well, I have an adapter that fits in here, so let's see if it works. And it's like, oh, yeah, it does. All right, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure if it would. So I guess what you're saying is that there could be a, a Thunderbolt port that is meant for data and not video data purposes. Mm -hmm. Just something yeah. I was wondering about. I thought we'd talk about it. And yeah. I, I, I don't think I have all the answers because this is the first time I've plugged something into a port of that shape and it worked. So I'm like, okay, that's fun. Right. Right. I'm trying to figure out, huh? Yeah, I don't, hmm. I'm trying to think of an example where a, deport, a port like that is not video capable. It might very well be. All, I think on the Mac, they all are. Oh, on the Mac, they They're are. Potential I'm just, both. I'm just wondering on like, you know, this CalDigit Thunderbolt dock that I have in front of me. And I think it is. So, yeah. It'd be interesting if you plug the video adapter in there and see what happens. Oh, I guess my real question here is that, so could you yeah. take a dock that has 
additional Thunderbolt ports and within the bandwidth limits of the host, right. could you plug a whole boatload of monitors into those? And that could be a solution versus like, a, you know, because in the past we've had people ask that and it's like, well, do you use a HDMI splitter? That's another way to do it. But right, right. Yeah. I'm trying, I'm well, looking I'm, here. I, I have no, well, you know, I do have yeah. a port on my MacBook Pro. Maybe I'll get another screen for it too. Yeah, I think this Cal Digit one would. So, yeah, it's hard. I, I don't. I let us know what happens when you plug a monitor in there. There you go. No, it'll do it. It'll do it. It's just the question is, would everything do it? But we don't know. Um, and you know, John, I think that's probably the safe place for us to uh, to vamp on out of here. Yeah, because we've got some we've got some more follow ups, but it's all. Uh, cloud backup yeah. and crash plan related and I, I we're not going to be able to squeeze that in to like four minutes I don't right. think I think so we're going to leave you in a four safe and a half. place or in a safe it. space yeah. if you need one of those well it's we'll the middle of, of Labor Day weekend so we gotta you know we gotta give people we gotta give people safe spots I think <laughs> don't you? <laughs> well it'd prevent workplace injuries certainly that's our that's our goal well, that's our our goal here is to prevent workplace injuries Huh. Zero days since the last accident. It is zero days. No, no, no. We've It's been far more than zero days. Not zero. Days since last accident not equal to zero. How about that? Is that Has good? anyone ever injured themselves on TMO property? I, I do not believe that has happened. Uh, have there been I any do, claims? I do have the workers' comp uh, certificate right here because we have to display yeah. it conspicuously. So. Really? Well, yeah, that's state law. You know, you got to display it conspicuously. Okay. So, um, yeah. All right. But have there been any notable injury claims as of late? There have been no injury claims. No. Okay. No. I think I know why that is. Well, I mean, because we we don't hurt ourselves. I mean. <laughs> well, I think it's also because it's one of our guiding principles. Yeah. Oh, it, it's true. You know, let's wait a minute to share that guiding principle. John. I know, but I think it's relevant. It is relevant. No, you're, you're totally right. Hey, uh, so I want to thank... Well, I want to thank all of you for listening. Because that's important. Thanks for uh, thanks for everything. It's been 12 and a half years. It's fun. It's good. If you have something to say to us, feedback at MacGeekGab.com is the right place to do so. Unless you're a premium listener, then you already know what to do. Right. And... Um the other address you could write to is feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Or lastly, feedback at MacGeekGab.com if the other two are not to your liking. <laughs> you can call us at 224-888-GEEK, which John translates to 4335. And you can find us on Twitter. He is John F. Braun. The show is MacGeekGab. I'm Dave Hamilton. You can find Mac Observer. And uh, I talked to Pilot. I talked with Pilot Pete this week. Uh, I think we may be able to figure it out to get him back involved on a more regular basis. I miss having that guy around. So you can find Pilot Pete on Twitter, too. He's busy flying right now, though. That's because that's what he does. That's how it goes. I want to thank Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. I want to thank our sponsors, of course, as we mentioned during the show, we have Smile at smilesoftware.com slash geek with their PDF pen family. We have care.com. We're at care.com slash MGG. You get 30% off a premier membership. And we have harrys.com slash MGG where you can go and get your free trial pack. Trial razor kit really is the right way to say it. Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Barebones Software at barebones.com. John, I want to say thanks to you, so thank you. Oh, no, thank you. And uh, because we're so harmonious here, I want to be sure and share that tidbit of advice in exactly the right way. Don't get caught, 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 get caught,
Cadena.